Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another episode of our Facebook Live series. It's really great to have you with us, and it's great to welcome Dr. Lena Miyakawa, who's an assistant professor of medicine here at the Icon School of Medicine, the associate director of our intensive care unit here at Beth Israel, and such a you know a pleasure to get to work with. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Dr. Weissman. Lovely to be here. So I, we're talking about a really exciting topic today, which is uh, lung cancer, and and I think specifically lung cancer screening. But maybe to start us off, can you can you just give us a little bit of background about you know what lung cancer is and how big a problem it is and and why we should care about it? Absolutely. So let's start off with the the why we care because I think that's really important. So. Yeah. It's the second most common cause of cancer in men and women across the board, and it's right behind prostate and breast cancer, which gets a lot of media coverage. It is the leading cause of cancer death worldwide and in the United States. There's about 2,000 new cases per year, and 80% of those are diagnosed at an advanced age. And so common sense would tell you if you're at an advanced age, your survival rate is pretty low. And it does go to show you that five-year relative survival is about... 23%. And if you compare that to breast and prostate cancer, it's over 90%. Hmm. So, you know, it ranges from anywhere from 7% to 60%. um, And 7% is when you're diagnosed at a very advanced age and 60% if we find it localized. So at a risk of stating the obvious, you know, earlier diagnosis, the better. And I think that's why we're talking about the screening um, recommendations today. Um, and you asked a little bit about like, what is lung cancer? So let's talk about that. So there are different types of lung cancer. Um, there is what we call classifications. This is what the pathologist tells us under a microscope. They take a look at the tissue and they're able to tell us what kind of lung cancer it is. So a majority is what we call non-small cell lung cancer. It's about 85%. The types are adenocarcinoma, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, large cell. There are other types, things like mesothelioma, which is uh, cancer of the lining of the lung. Um, there's also things like sarcoma, which usually are in different parts of the lo- uh, body, but also can be in the lung. And then lastly, I do want to mention sometimes patients tell me, you know, I had lung cancer, but it actually was from somewhere else. And it mm-hmm. to the lung, things like breast cancer, kidney cancer, spreads to the lung. Got it. So when we're talking about lung cancer screening in this context, are we looking for all of those different things or only certain types get picked up? That's a great question. So lung cancer screening itself looks for all of those. Um, It doesn't necessarily really look for mesothelioma or sarcoma per se, but it looks for anything that is inside the lungs or maybe right outside the lungs in from the neck all the way down to the diaphragm. Um, So it's able to capture a lot of those things, even things like uh, thyroid uh, cancer sometimes is caught on those. Hmm. So so tell me a little bit, I mean, I know the the guidelines for screening have changed a little bit over the last couple of years. So take me through, you know, what the what the newest guidelines are, who should be getting tested, how they get tested. And I mean, is this only smokers that we're talking about now? Yeah. So um, let's talk about the dry stuff first, the the, the screening. Well, what, is, what does that say? So the United States uh, Preventative Services Task Force, the U.S. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mouthful, yep. <laughs> talks about anywhere from age 50 to 80, all adults, um, a little bit of on the older end, not younger, that are smokers, current or past. And for the past smokers, they have to be at least 20 pack years. And how do you get it to 20 pack years? If you smoke one pack a day for 20 years, it's multiplied as 20 pack years. So um, anybody that is in that category should get an annual low dose CT scan. So that's, this is not the CT scan that most people get when they go to the emergency room with shortness of breath. It is a low dose, so a lower dose of radiation that we expose patients to. Now, this screening that we talk about, this kind of range of patients, we, it is recommended by a lot of different committees. So there is the American Cancer um, Association, there is the American College of Chest Physicians, even things like Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services recommend this. So I think the really most important thing here is that the screening comes with benefits and, you know, 
also with some limitations. And so I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but I think it's important to mention that shared decision-making discussion is part of the recommendations from all these committees to talk about the potential benefits, the limitations, harm, things like that. Um, and I think I'd be remiss to not mention that there has been a change. You had mentioned that there was a recent change in all of this. And so why do we change it? I think let's mention that for a second. So in 2013, these recommendations came out and they're slightly different from what it is now. And now in 2021, it's uh, lowered the age. So it used to be 55 to 80. Now it's 50 to 80. And then also mm -hmm. the smoking history used to be 30 pack years. Now it's 20 pack years. Um, and this was to try to increase the proportion of eligible population at risk. And this was particularly in Blacks and women. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you asked me about smoking. Is this all just about smokers? Why, you know, is it just smokers? So um, to put aside some of the, the screening uh, recommendations, just let's talk about smoking for a second. There's a lot of stigma around smoking and lung cancer. And I think that might be part of why, you know, some of the uh, research out there is not as robust as, let's say, breast cancer, let's say. So um, smoking, it is still the most common cause for lung cancer. About 90% um, is associated with lung cancer. Um, 94 million people in the United States are probably still at risk for lung cancer with all of these screening um, recommendations that we're talking about. Um, but let's say, you know, what about that 10% of non-smokers? What, you know, are they at risk? You know, what, should we be talking about them? And I think um, the stats are something like one to 10 men and one to 20 women. Um, and if we talk about other populations, spe specifically East Asian women are at risk for a specific type of lung cancer called adenocarcinoma with a specific mutation. It's called EGFR. Um, all of these are non-smokers. And so, you know, what's putting them at risk? And I think this is something that we don't talk about as often, um, but uh, secondhand smoke. So environmental pollution is one of them. So someone that a loved one, someone that you live with smokes, um, that can also put you at risk. Uh, another environmental pollution would be indoor cooking. Uh, so people mm. cook indoors with wood or coal and that smoke that's in the air, that can put you at risk. Um, treatment for other cancers. So if you personally have cancer yourself and you're getting treated with radiation or chemotherapy, those are also at risk. Uh, COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or emphysema, that's usually associated with um, smoking, but not always. Pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, big thing that uh, that we you should talk to your doctor about is family history. So if you have a strong uh, primary or secondary relative that has uh, lung cancer, you should talk about that with your doctor. And then lastly, um, work exposure. So things like uh, weirder things like asbestos or radon. So all of those are going to put you at risk. So these, I mean, that's, you make so many great points there. I mean, I, it sounds like, I mean, obviously people who are smoking should stop. Even people who've stopped smoking within the last bunch of years still qualify for this screening test. Um, and there aren't, I don't think, guidelines for most of those other groups you mentioned for people who are just exposed to secondhand smoke at home there's no clear guideline for how, you know whether those folks should get tested, at least not yet, whether those folks should get tested or screened for, for lung cancer, right? Exactly, and that was gonna be my next point. And I think there are some studies that are ongoing about non-smokers. How do we capture that population that we're missing? And you know, we're not quite ready to say the benefit is there for all patients. I think you know it goes to say that screening really should maximize the benefit and minimize minimize the harm. And so we don't want to harm these patients that may not be enough at risk and start screening them if we don't have to. It is something exciting that's on the horizon. Um, you know, things like blood cancer screening, so you know, circulating blood tumor DNA, being able to just get it by a blood test. I think that would mm -hmm. be if we could use things like that and capture those high-risk individuals. Right. So, I mean, I love this screening test because it's, as you said, it's a low-dose CT, so it's less radiation and it's non-contrast. So I'm not worried about people, you know, needing an IV or hurting their kidneys or whatever from it. So maybe take me through a little bit of that risk-benefit alternatives conversation and, and maybe start with, I guess, the good parts about it. I, you know, we just named a couple of them. Tell me the good parts and then tell me, what, you know, what I have to be afraid of. Sure, absolutely. I think we we talk about all screening um, recommendations having pros and cons. And so the pro is 
it's pretty minimal um, harm overall. And that's actually been shown by uh, uh, some big studies out there. Some of the studies that are that came out, one in the United States, which is like 2011, um, this thing called National Lung Screening Trial. They looked at 53,000 patients, so a huge population. Mm -hmm. They were actually able to decrease the lung cancer-related mortality by 20%. So they, they did, which was very similar to the, the um, recommendations now, 55 to 75 smokers. Uh, they had randomized all these patients to either a chest x-ray annually or a low dose CT annually. And then that came out with a 20% reduction in um, cancer related, uh, lung cancer related mortality. And then there's another one, Nelson trial in the Netherlands, uh, very similarly, 26% like decrease in lung cancer related mortality. Mm. So good stuff out there. Um, yeah. So I think that's the, the great stuff. Um, but so what's the not, yeah, what's the not so good stuff? <laughs> so let's talk about the, the bad stuff. So, you know, how what, what are the risks associated with this? And th this is the conversation that I end up having with, you know, my patients in, in the outpatient clinic. And I want them to be aware that there's always risks associated with anything that we do. And so I think number one is pretty straightforward overdiagnosis. Um, any screening test is going to have any kind of um, a, a small amount of overdiagnosis. And that's kind of um, calculated into the screening recommendations in all these uh, societies out there. Now, the one that I get asked about all the time is the radiation exposure. And mm. uh, when I was younger, when I was uh, in, when I just started training, um, I think I like to compare the risk to, oh, it's just like flying across the country. Oh, it's just like, you know, you're standing in front of a microwave. None of these are great ways to explain what the risk is. Um, but so, you know, at a risk, you know, I hate but it's minimal radiation that people get exposed to in the course of their lives anyway. Absolutely. And I think, you know, there's studies to show that. And so the one thing I do want to mention, though, the, the younger you are, the more years you're going to be monitored. And you had mentioned earlier that if you had quit smoking many, many years ago, you, you're not you don't really qualify under the screening guidelines. But the younger you are, maybe the benefit is not there as much. And that's why that mm -hmm. age starts at 50, because the more times you're getting screened, obviously, that adds up. Okay, So I think it's something to say. Okay. Okay. And then the last um, thing, actually, I'll talk about two more things. Okay. Okay. Because <laughs> um, we're, we're going to talk about what happens when you find something and then it leads to a procedure. And so that, what does that procedure risk look like? And so I think, you know, procedures across the board, I think, uh, at a big institution are pretty low. So 60-day curative lung cancer surgery, the perioperative mortality associated with that is like 1%. Um, a bronchoscopy, which is kind of like a colonoscopy, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, where we take a look with a camera down and, and do a biopsy. That also is about one and a half out of 10,000 patients that get some any kind of you know bad outcome, um, any kind of death or major complication across the board for all benign nodules, also very low, four out of 10,000. So procedure complications, I think, across the board are pretty low. Okay. Right. And I think about that. But, you know, at the same on the same hand, you know, getting finding nodules is sort of why we're doing this. I often worry about what happens when you find something somewhere else in the body that, you know, you weren't intending to. And all of a sudden you discover something that you have to then chase down. What how often does that happen and how worried should I be about that? Yeah, I think um, there is definitely this, you know, what the medical jargon is incidental lomas or incidentally we find something and what do we do with that? And I think there's, as we can imagine, some psychological distress that comes with that, that kind of prolonged uncertainty, you know, what do I do with it? And how I have to now wait to, you know, find out what's happening. Now I have to wait to get another CT scan or whatever it may be. Um, and so I think I really want to recognize that. And I think that's what I always want to talk about our, uh, with my patients, because that I can't really take away other than reassurance. But that um, studies do look at this and short term, the quality of life, anxiety, distress, all of those things may go up. But long term, we're talking about two years follow up. It, it's about the same. So know that we are able to get some answers for you and be able to uh, reassure you as time goes on. Right. And that's, I mean, sometimes that's a tricky conversation, right? Because on the one hand, people say, well, oh, if you found something you didn't know you were even looking for, isn't that a good thing? And the answer is maybe if it helps us, 
you know, save your life or help you live longer or whatever. If it's something that wasn't going to do anything and now we're creating more testing and more anxiety and more invasive procedures to try to figure out if it's a good thing or not, that turns into a real harm of this, of this whole screening process. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's why I made a point earlier that, you know, we don't know the exact magnitude of the cumulative risk associated with all of these things. And so I think that decision to undertake screening is really a decision that should be happening with the patient and the physician with a discussion of all of these things that we talked about, potential benefits, limits, and all of those things. Got it. Okay. So we have this risk benefit conversation. We decide to move forward. We do the test. It finds some nodule in the lungs, the kind of thing we're looking for. So what do we do next? Okay. So we now see this thing. So we have to take a look at this thing. And you know, you can always ask your doctor, I want to, I want to see also, because how I explain to my patients is it's like finding a mole on your skin. We can now look at it, but on a CT scan, it's similar, but it's just inside. And so we can only look at it in a CT scan. And the characteristics of the mole are what we call a nodule inside the lungs. And the size of it really is going to tell us what to do next. And so if it's depending on what it looks like, we may do a repeat CT scan in the short term. That may look like three to six months. Um, and we may end up going straight to a biopsy if we're concerned. And so what does that biopsy look like? Who does it? Um, and so um, I'm a pulmonologist, and so I can do those biopsies, but there are other people that do those. So a pulmonologist is able to do it with a bronchoscopy or a, what we call an endobronchial ultrasound. Both of those things, there's a camera at the end of a long scope that goes down your mouth and it, or your nose, and it goes and takes a look and takes a biopsy for the nodule and any lymph nodes that we're able to find. Um, now, surgery can also go in and take a biopsy or take a piece of your lung out. That's thoracic surgery. And lastly, interventional radiology. They're the least invasive. They're able to look at these nodules with a CT scan in real time and take a needle through the skin into your lung and take a biopsy and then send that off to pathology. So after we're able to get some kind of tissue, we're able to send that off to the pathologist. They're able to put, take, it, um, take a look at it under a microscope and do some further testing. And then they're able to tell us what we talked about earlier, the characteristics of, or the classifications of the lung cancer itself. Um, and in conjunction to all of these things, we may ask you that you should get more imaging and that's to see if there's any kind of distant spread. So if the characteristics, the size is worrisome, the um, lung cancer tends to spread to the brain, unfortunately. And so MRI brain might be something that we talk about. A PET scan is might be something that we talk about so that we can take a look at the whole body. Um, and so I think those are the things that would happen uh, right after this would ha um, we find something. So sometimes based on the on the size of the nodule or the characteristics of the initial nodule or nodules, I guess, sometimes you decide, I'll just wait three or six months, I think you said, to do another one. And there you're really looking to see if it's growing, because if it's growing slowly or it's not growing, maybe it's nothing and, and not to worry about. And if it is growing or it looks particularly big or a lot of them or whatever, then we got to go down this whole path of these invasive tests. And that's, as you said, where some of the risk comes from and, but also where the potential benefit comes from that we're diagnosing something that's not causing any symptoms or not um, creating problems that people would have noticed if we hadn't done all this sort of proactive. Um, screen, Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's, it's good to mention that there are multidisciplinary teams out there to kind of look at what, like I just mentioned a whole bunch of things that we can do and what, what is the best way for you, the patient, and what, what's the best way to get a diagnosis. And I think though that kind of discussion is really important to happen. I think the value of having that kind of team is, is important. And, you know, there's things called uh, tumor boards every week that, um, you know, patients don't come to, but, you know, all of us, we, we go to, and there's, thoracic surgery, there's oncology, radiation oncologist, molecular pathologist, thoracic radiologist, um, us, oh, pulmonologist, interventional pulmonologist. We all get to talk uh, talk about these types of complicated cases and figure out what the best next step is. 
How do you involve the patients in that conversation? Because I could imagine some patients saying, I can't wait three months for a repeat. I'm, you know, I'm going to be panicking every night that there's something growing inside of me. And other patients saying, no way is somebody sticking a needle in my lung. I'd rather, you know, sit tight for three months and see what happens. How do you, how do you navigate that conversation with the patients? That's a tough conversation. And I think that's what really takes the physician-patient relationship to a different level and making sure that you trust your physician, making sure that you communicate um, your needs. Because I think we can tailor all of these things to what the patient wants. And so I think having that conversation is important, saying that you're really anxious about these things. We may be able to push up the imaging, um, you know, not wait a year or six months. We can say it's three months is better. Or maybe we can go straight to the biopsy and then talk about the risks associated with that biopsy. Now, sometimes we just find little moles and a little mole is nothing, right? Usually, right? But then when that mole starts to grow and it looks it looks a little weird, that's when we start to worry. And so I think some reassurance, making sure that we can also visually show you what worrisome nodules look like versus a benign nodule looks like. Got it. All right. So before we wrap up today, I know, you know, we've talked about a lot of the advances in screening and, and how successful this has been and how, um, uh, you know, the guidelines have changed over time and kudos to a, a lot of folks in the Sinai system who really led the uh, March uh, for starting this uh, screening program and for doing a lot of the research that's really changed how we do it now. Um, there's also a lot of great advancements in in treatment for lung cancers. So without going too much into depth, that's I'll invite you back for another episode to talk about lung cancer treatment. But what uh, you know, what should people be mindful of as they're thinking about treatment options or the or the new advances? So. Lung cancer used to be almost like a death sentence. It used to be that we find it so advanced and your five-year mortality is just through the roof and there's not much out there. It's really just hit you hard with chemotherapy and that was it. And actually there's been a lot of advances um, recently where we're able to get targeted therapies or immunotherapy. And some of these are just pills. And so of course you have to have that specific genetic mutation to qualify for that, but it's not just chemotherapy and radiation anymore. So I think it really behooves the patients to really kind of go through the steps and listen to, you know, um, kind of what's out there first before deciding, no way, I don't want any of this treatment. Why would I want it, you know, and and um, kind of move on? Because I think there's a lot of things out there now that are on the horizon that is great um, for lung cancer treatment. Yeah, so many exciting advances. That's great. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Miyakawa. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, and we'll see you next time.